Good evening and welcome to the TNT pre-show everyone. Uh, we'll just have a little chatter now as you log in and check your audio and video and, and get settled. Um, here in North America, we're still in a, a renewed struggle for social justice as a means to achieve greater equality for all and to stop the systemic violence against people of color and minority groups around the world. Also here, more specifically in British Columbia, we're slowly alert, emerging from the health pandemic and the museum is actually preparing to open in a few weeks and I'll actually reveal that date once we're right into the show. Um, last week, uh, Joseph Tissica uh, did a wonderful uh, examination of issues around uh, indigenous uh, territory and rights. And just as a, a compliment to that, we want to show a little bit of Joseph Tissaga gear that we have available in our shop right now, which is online. And this is Joseph's Prop for Reconciliation Dilton, which is uh, based on the piece in our collection that we talked about last week, as well as Tales of an Empty Cabin, the catalog uh, that was part of Joseph's exhibition here last year. So we're going to go right into the broadcast here. We're hoping everybody is tuned in and has their audio running. And here we go, Justine. Thank you. Okay, everyone. Welcome to episode six of the Tuesday Night Talks. And as I said in the pre-show, this broadcast is tempered by the collision of an ongoing health pandemic and the violence of systemic uh, racism around the world. Tonight, we're back in the Odain Art Museum's vault by the flashlights glow during this period of closure. And it's here in Whistler, which is on the shared territories of the Squamish and Lillooet nations. Uh, we have over 250 people registered for tonight's talk. So again, uh, an ongoing su success as part of our new efforts at virtual engagement. Um, behind me is a work from 2014-15, Rose Snow and Pink Sky, A Universe for Carl Hart. It's an oil, acrylic, and graphite on canvas that comes to the museum courtesy of the O'Dane Foundation. And live from East Vancouver in her home, we have a 2002 Visual Arts and Media Arts uh, Governor General's winner, award winner, Landon McKenzie. Hello, Landon. Hi, can you see me? Yes, we can. Oh, wonderful backdrop and a beautiful <laughs> baby blue couch. Well, we're doing it this way because uh, we know the Zoom might work. Oh, and very Dr. good. General's was 2017, uh, that, just to clarify. But oh, thank you. A really important, um, a really important um, event in my life in order to open up a lot more stuff. So thank you. That's excellent. And so uh, tonight for our viewers, Landon is going to discuss, uh, in addition to the work behind me, the larger context of her practice in terms of her, her studio methods, as well as uh, a relationship to a larger particle uh, painting series. So I'm going to hand the broadcast over to you now, Landon. Thanks, dear. Okay, Curtis, I wanna thank you a lot for inviting me. I also have um, seen all the other broadcasts and they're all really excellent. So I encourage people to go see them. They're all on the website now. Um, they're, they're great. They're, they're different from one another and they show a lot of um, different kinds of work. Um, I really wanna help tonight by um, acknowledging that we're in a really difficult time. I know Curtis has mentioned it. I'm, in East Van on the other territories of the Squamish, the Musqueam and the Tsleil-Waututh. Glad to be here. Um, raised my kids in this house and normally I'd be at the studio, but there, there isn't that reliable an internet there. Um, I wanna thank Michael and Yoshi. So Michael O'Dane, Yoshi Kawasaka, Kawasawa, very much for their support and also the O'Dane family and the staff and, and the trustees as well. I know the museum is a very special project. Um, I'm glad to be part of it. Um, 
So maybe we could start with the slides that would take us to the studio where we're not able to be tonight. Under COVID-19, we've devised a system of cards. We've been in the building for almost 35 years and now we have a system that I actually designed like a grade three project. So when we come in, we can say who's in the building and uh, work accordingly. It's been a tough time and here I wanted to be in my vault, I suppose. This is like Curtis is in the vault at the O'Dane Museum and this would be my vault, which uh, has paintings and rolls and the work that you're gonna be seeing that I'm talking about tonight that's in the collection would come on one of those sort of candy wrapped sort of stretchers on Sonotube with its collapsible stretchers. Um, if we were at the studio, this is what it'd be looking like tonight with one of the new paintings. Um, and the floor covered with cardboard protecting another. Um, again, these warehouses are really special to work in and we've been a collective for a long, long time. Uh, six of the original people that started it in 1986 are still there. And I know you met Ian Wallace on the very first night of the series. And Ian is one of the originals along with myself. Um, we work with a lot of stuff. And when you walk in, it's like you practice your thing. Uh, this is the oil cart, and I have also another one for acrylic polymers. Uh, this is a painting I finished finally when being allowed back into the studio after a bit of lockdown called COVID Night. So these are large paintings, and they all owe a bit of a debt to the painting we're going to be talking about tonight. The particle paintings and this way of working and following little lines of logic. So I'm gonna come back now just to introduce the painting that's in the collection. Um, just before that painting, I was invited to do an exhibition at the Vancouver Art Gallery with Emily Carr, which was a, a great honor. And I did a lot of research about her again. I've been a professor at the institution that bears her name. I have to say when I arrived in Vancouver in 1986 to take up that position, People were very hostile about her and about the name of the school being changed from the Vancouver School of Art to the name Emily Carr College of Art. So I became a little defensive about trying to understand her. And the more complex you look, complexly you look at Carr, the more interesting she gets. For the exhibition that I did at the, uh, the Vancouver Art Gallery, um, I put 30 of her works together with 20 of mine and the elephant in the room was in the works that I was interested in from her in the 1930s of these kind of, for, I would say in quotation marks, forlorn to our Western eye, dark green lush um, hybrid village spaces. They're empty in the sense that they're not empty at all, but that this is how she pictures them in a studio environment that she's working in in the 1930s. So I made the painting Big Pink Sky bracket TB uh, which was the first of these big pink sky particle paintings to kind of acknowledge that she's looking at a space that has been very harmed by disease. Smallpox, particularly in 1861 and 62, going up the coast and really devastating um, First Nation communities. And then followed by tuberculosis, of which Carr's own mother and brother had died, and it was the leading cause of death in many cities at that time. So it's interesting that we're in a COVID pandemic now. We're living in a very intense time with this pandemic, which we share around the world, but with different resources um, and situations. We're so lucky in British Columbia. And yet, as I know through my partner Donald's work, we will lose more people to the illicit drug supply and opioid crisis than to COVID-19. Um, and our fellow citizens are marching and protesting with with passion to correct a lot of systemic injustices that we still uh, face. So as an artist, I can't really deal with everything at once, but I do find it a very, uh, very useful tool to try to unpack some sort of complex things that I'm sort of swimming around. So maybe we can go to the first slide, Justine. This is a picture of the work, which is rose snow and pink sky a universe for Carl Hart, as you would approach it when you walked into the O'Dane Museum in room two. So when you came into the museum, you would have seen Wallachtan's beautiful cylindrical totem steel structure outside the Pat Cow building, which is a magnificent building. You would have heard perhaps the other night him talking very eloquently about making that work. 
Then you would go into the Grand Hall and you would see the Paul Wong, really great neon work, which you also can see in, I think, episode two, Paul walking us through how he made that piece. And then as you entered the galleries, the first gallery with the old and historic West Coast masks, First Nation masks, you see at the end of that, the magnificent, the dance screen, the Scream 2. This is such an important work. And in dealing with this work, one, one looks at just, just how art has, has moved across so much time and is still so, so important. But one of the carvers of the screen um, is Jim Hart and his son, Carl Hart. Jim, uh, the great, really great British Columbia artist. Um, I'd had a chance to meet him and Rosemary and Gualica when we were in England for the opening of the car show at the Dulwich that Jim was a co-curator of with Sarah Milroy, who's now at the McMichael. So I was kind of connected at that moment. And I was still very much connected with the first work I'd made, the Big Pink Sky TV. This is Gerda Murray looking at the work. She's a very important um, mentor to me and friend and a scholar of Carr's work, very important scholar. And here she is looking at the work, but anybody who looks at the work picks up what they can. If you see that we read the works through our bodies. So maybe the next slide. I focused on the title in this slide and the word rose in the sense that I was aware of a couple of ideas. Um, in this painting, I was trying to deal with a tragedy or a sudden understanding of a tragedy. And I knew that rose, the word rose is a symbolic word and also it grounds us to the earth. And it, I also knew it was the name of the first part of um, Carl Hart's mother, Rosemary. We can go to the next slide. It's, it's always easier for a viewer to look at a piece of paper, a card, and be literate about the title. So titles play a really interesting role in our artworks in terms that they, they tip you off or they tip the viewer off as to where the artist may want you to sort of drift. Um, while preparing for tonight, I actually went outside the studio and saw this really interesting just scene on the sidewalk of rose petals. Um, falling to the earth, which really confirmed how they look sort of like, you know, those little bits that have come to earth. And I wanted to just throw that slide in to remind myself that this connection between following a line of logic, then another, then another. And we go to the next slide. At the time that I was working on the big Emily Carr show and researching her and trying to take a very open mind to how that time was very complex and she was complex as well and the Big Pink Sky TB painting, I was starting the next painting. So for me, when a painting leaves the studio, there's usually an impetus to start another one. Um, and often I have four or five of these huge ones on the go at any time. And I try to take about a year to finish a work, letting time and a sort of performative relationship take hold. So in this work, I was halfway through this painting and I had a son working in Zambia at a time when in the school he was working in, there were a lot of kids whose mothers had died of HIV. Ebola was happening on the other side of Africa. So there's a lot of anxiety when you're a mother or a parent and thinking about how your children are doing in the world. And when I heard that Carl Hart had died, it just spun me, maybe because so many things were happening that are too long to go into, but just that how would you make a painting that continues this story of grief in that the first painting in the series deals sort of with the idea perhaps of Carr visiting a place like Haida Gwaii, making her own paintings and her own ideas about that, that time and her experience of it. Uh, and then a young artist in Haida Gwaii um, dying as just one of many young people that are dying today, but still somebody whose family I just watched at a very height of of, of sort of wonderfulness when we were able to see the show in England and their, you know, their sense of pride of their family and their time. In this painting, you'll see there's sort of a palimpsest where there, it starts with a dark color, which is a shadowy color, like this Payne's gray. And then it's covered with layers of white, layers of red, which become pink. And as the layers of white continue. But when I decided that I wanted to follow kind of a universe for Carl Hart. 
I immediately started thinking about, well, if he was to go on a journey and he is from this beautiful place in British Columbia, perhaps you'll need more green. And so I painted in a lot of green dots throughout the whole painting that you see here. And then over time, I painted them out with snowflakes and I thought it was finished. And then I decided that maybe he needed blue because the ocean is blue and the sky is blue and he needs more blue. So I painted a lot of blue dots throughout the whole painting. And again, over time, I sort of covered them with snowflakes. There's a few little secret ones that still exist in purple and in green and so on. But basically, it came to a point where if I could walk into the studio and feel that this kind of feeling I'm trying to get um, is starting to become achieved, it's only for me, of course, that I can decide that it's resolved, but it's ready to go out. And at that time, Michael O'Dane came to the studio to see it, and we had a frank talk about what was the motivation for the work or what I was thinking about with the work. And we both came to the conclusion that A Universe for Carl Hart should be on that card, uh, that it was important to be more specific in this case, given the, particularly the symmetry in the museum of the dance screen and this work. Maybe next slide. So here's the one that was made for the Vancouver Art Gallery show, again, over a year. And you can see that it's more sort of disease-like and droplet, but watching viewers approach it in the museum at the VAG, you could see them sort of go, ha, 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 it's like candy floss at the fair, or it's pink, it's like pink bows and pink ribbons. And as an artist, I never studied painting, but I sure knew as a woman that I wasn't allowed to put pink in a painting. And so these pink paintings are a little bit of a resistance to some of that. Next slide. So I put the third one in the series in a situation here where you could sort of see it again. This has been moved from the studio to be photographed. And I just thought it was important to remind us tonight that we're looking at photographs of paintings, not paintings. We're not there to see them and unravel them in bits and pieces with our bodies where you go in and out and across and it looks different depending on which day it is or whether it's snowing right behind you like the day I installed it in the museum or when I first stretched it up from the roll it was this beautiful snowstorm that sort of mirrored the one that um, is in the collection. This one's called uh, Big Pink slash Broken Green or Big Pink Broken Green no commas actually in the end. Next slide and it shows a kind of way of thinking about the space are we looking at it as a like a topographical map or looking down at it across uh, maybe lines carved in history, or are we looking at a cellular diagram? And I think that, you know, I'm very lucky tonight. Um, I also have just opened a show in Toronto. It's the first show at the Nicholas Mativier Gallery as they've opened up the space from COVID. But I'm really aware of how COVID-like all my paintings sort of feel to me right now. Next slide. So that series went on and this one is Wolf Moon, bracket Big Pink Sky because of the series. And I have a kind of conceptual principle. When I was a young artist, I studied conceptual art at NESCAD in the early seventies and not painting. And I also did a lot of work in printmaking and drawing. But to me, this one, Wolf, Wolf Sky, continued this kind of unusual track for me where the whole series felt accurate to be more like a memorial of some sort to history and whatever. And in this one, the focus was, I lost my brother and father within 24 hours. And so I really needed a place to work with that. And art isn't perfect, but it is a place where individual artists can find a conversation for themselves. And that's a very, that's a real privilege. So next, we're going to go back maybe just to talking briefly and broadly back in the room. Um, you know, after 40 years making those kind of works, obviously they don't come overnight. You make a commitment to a way to work. You find that it works for you. You find there's a way to unravel or untangle things. So sometimes I'm in a big studio and it works, but a lot of the time I'm not, and nor are you. You might be on a kitchen table or you may be just uh, traveling a little bit. And during traveling, I find you're a bit lonely or you're a bit destabilized, you're a little bit more open. And I've done a lot of work on paper over many years um, while traveling. But also I've been invited kind of recently to a few big residencies where they bring you in and you have a lot of material. So we'll just start the next slides. And we're going to the work on paper. And in fact, the show I've just opened actually focuses on the work on paper side of my practice. So back to the studio, you just see things lying around. Some of these were in 
the way I was laying things out before we made the final selection to go to Toronto, but these are tend to be the smaller type of works. I have a different studio at 188, which is for my works on paper and my sort of history, because I find I can't really see these if I'm in the big studio making the big paintings. They just seem too insignificant. They need a space where they become their own fictitious worlds. So this is another image of a studio um, where I was twice in the last two years in China, very close to where this pandemic began in a place called Tawatan, very beautiful rural place. And you can see I've been given a greenhouse that's full of bunk beds because when the artist residency isn't there or the opera residency isn't there, there's a, a normal children's camp. And after working on them, I smuggle them back on a suitcase um, on a tube and I, I look at them and here they are sort of some of the works that I've made on these trips back in the studio. So we'll just stop there for a moment and I'm gonna just show you a little bit in a very practical way about how that works. So you're, you know you're gonna to have to work. So you're gonna to have to arrive with you know, brushes that you like. And even those huge paintings, I work on small brushes. And then usually I would take um, papers, but in China, I was able to go to one of the oldest paper factories in the world and buy quite a lot of this um, pretty fantastic paper that I've been using a lot of. Um, then I smuggle them back on a tube. This is a very, this is one of the smaller ones where you can wrap sometimes 25 works and then you smuggle them into your hockey bag. Good Canadian girl has a hockey bag. Well, actually it's a more deluxe <laughs> kind of hockey bag. Uh, and then I get them back on the roll. So when I get them to the studio though, I want to just uh, say I've tried to prepare because I'm not in a studio tonight, although I'm wearing my studio dress, you know, and, but you know, you can get them up and they might look like this. Or they might look like, you know, this. So you can see really quickly, there's quite a strong relationship to the big paintings. And I'm interested in how they kind of go back and forth. But I would never have gotten where I've gotten without a bunch of things. And one is that I grew up around artists. And that's why I was able to not study painting and able to study art and be become an artist and have some sort of sense of seeing the world through these. So I unframed a very important work that I grew up with. And it's a Joff McDonald ink and watercolor from 1954. Hope you can see that. He even took off the frame because it was glaring. He made this in France, in Nice, in the one and only year that he traveled outside Canada, back from, from since when he had been to Emily Carr from Scotland. So as you know, you may know, some people may know, in 1926, he came out to start the design school at the Emily Carr, which was then the School of Applied and Decorative Arts. Um, he came out with Fred Varley, or Varley brought him out, I think. And when I just did this recent show, uh, Joyce Siemens was able to tell me, um, as an expert on McDonald's work, who was a group of uh, Painters 11 artists in Toronto eventually, um, but in this one year, it was a really important year where if he could get the kind of feeling in his work on paper onto canvas when he came back, he'd be okay. So let's uh, go to the next slides. We're going to sort of look at work on paper. So this is in the Toronto show right now. And I have to give a shout out to my gallery there, Nicholas Mativier Gallery and the whole team, because they've been really wonderful to work with. Um, and it's interesting how a small piece of paper, well, it's about 40 inches wide, can hold, I think, some of the same sort of feeling or universe as the really big works, or I hope so. And yet they're only done over two days. But there's always a principle where you make an intuitive response and then you make an analytical response and then you make another intuitive response and so on. And you fold these ways of working back and forward. This one's called Pink Star, I think. And they're different papers, like this is more of a European paper. The others were more of an Asian paper. Um, inks, watercolors, sometimes gessos, and then rolled back. And this is the last slide. And this is showing how one of them there that I made in China, um, some of them I've made in, uh, in, in Spain as well. It can be head to head with some of my other work. This was a show that's been sort of put on, on ice for a moment for COVID-19, the tour but it's from the West Vancouver Art Museum that we just closed. And you can see that it, it's beside one of my mapping works, but also beside the Jock McDonald oil on canvas that's very influential in my upbringing. And that was owned by my grandmother who was a good friend of Jock McDonald and that I somehow 
knew all my life and maybe it became the teacher in some ways. So I think that's it for the slides. Okay. Well, thank you so much uh, for putting it in such a Canadian art historical perspective and that wonderful uh, Jock McDonald work. Yep. Uh, also interested to learn about your covert activities as a traveling artist. In addition to how you oscillate between the analytical and the intuitive. So at this point in the program, we'll move to our question and answer part. And um, John in Vancouver asks, have you ever studied astronomy or spent time ex examining the universe? Okay, well, thanks, John, for that. Um, yeah, the show in Toronto is called The Moon is the Message. And of course, it plays on Marshall McLuhan's to praise. Medium is the message. Uh, for me, the moon is a really important way of um, feeling the people that came before me, my ancestors or my people that looked after me re more recently, like my dad. But um, I find if I'm on the other side of the world in rural China, where Tawatan was, or in rural Spain on the north coast in Noha, the, the moon is very important. And I don't think I am a trained astronomer in any way. I'm like a kid from Canada that grew up in enough sort of motor boats outside the city enough to really just be taught what a Big Dipper is and where, where the North Star might be and to now separate the satellites that are flowing around and the airplanes. And we're lucky because Donald and I have a place in Prince Edward Island that's pretty close to the wild Atlantic and you can really see the stars there. So I'm lucky. I was invited to be a guest artist with Astronomers Without Borders a few years ago. I'm completely a novice. I was with some pretty big company there. Thanks, John. Thank you. Okay, so Liz in Vancouver asks, how has your teaching influenced your practice? Well, hugely, absolutely. Um, I've taught all my professional life sort of ran away from high school to NESCAD and knowing that my parents would never forgive me, got a graduate degree and ended up teaching at Concordia. And then from there, I was brought to Emily Carr to teach. So they actually relocated me from the East to the West in the mid eighties. My students have been uh, great teachers and have gone on to be good artists. But also if you have to face every day, um, you know, some sort of way to convince people that working with this kind of crazy stuff and teaching painting, uh, which I never studied, <laughs> and uh, finding a way just to sort of help people make sense of their lives through it, it's, it's a very rich life. But I'm also really lucky because I had a professorship uh, at Emily Carr, which sort of treated me like a scientist. So I'm paid to be in the studio and in the classroom. And that meant I never really thought about the market. Like I didn't have to rely on the market. I could have shows, of course, and exhibitions, which are really important to your development. Um, but I wasn't tied to it to raise the three kids that we had. And it bought a lot of ambition in the work. It allowed me to work really large because I, I like working large. And I think as a woman in our field, um, I, I sort of played my early paintings off of the size of film. It's kind of a joke, but it, uh, it works for me. Thanks. Great. Uh, so a question that's just come in online, um, and it's from Kathleen in West Vancouver. Uh, she wants to know, in 2008, with the downturn in the economy, um, you know, the art market uh, is depressed. And similarly, now with the COVID pandemic, um, she wants to know, you know, how do you think uh, students and artists become more experimental when they're focusing less on commercial success and more on, I suppose, a tighter focus on the aesthetic? Well, I'm not the right person to ask because um, <laughs> I've never seen my work in a commercial light. And I've always followed the, the really good advice, which was put the ambition in the work and the rest will sort of fall into place. It won't necessarily fall into place. There aren't enough good venues and good curators with budgets to travel around and see things. So they, they really have to work um, with what they have. I've been really fortunate. Um, if, if, if somebody's thinking about their work as a commodity, they're off track right at the beginning. 
you have to make a strong attachment to the work. And through this attachment to the work, it becomes a thing. And then the schizophrenic part of our culture is that if you go skiing at Whistler, where you are, after three hours, you're just a better skier and you've had all these great moments. But if you've made something over those days or those hours, then you have a thing. And the, the culture says it should be sold or traded or stored or burnt. So this is the problem. I would just advise all my students, have a, as I had, get a great day job that uses up part of your personality that makes you crave working alone in the studio and you'll, you'll get somewhere. But thanks for the question, it's a good one. Okay. Um, the next question, it comes from Marnie, uh, Mercer Island, Washington. How does the concept of color speak to you now as an artist? Well, I, I, I respond to color a lot. Um, I worked in black and white when I was a, an artist in the 70s. That was sort of the, the way to go. Color was decadent, it was excessive, it was unnecessary. When I came to color after graduate school, I just found myself very, uh, you know, very strongly pulled um, by it. And maybe that's because if you've only made things without color, you, you have to pick the right color to make that thing. But it interests me that, for instance, Curtis, you and I could see a painting and we wouldn't see it the same way because there's a contract to decide that we know what pink is or what yellow is. And we know what yellow we think we're seeing. And we also know that men start to go colorblind. And women generally don't. Um, someone can correct me on that, but that's how I understand it. Um, for instance, I was invited to do the um, glass panels for the building that we just built on Great Northern Way for the Emily Carr University by the architects, Diamond Schmidt. And I worked with my colleague, Ben Reeves, who's a really great colorist too. And Ben and I put together a palette that would hold on its own of about 15 colors. And then I really felt strongly that we link that palette to the paintings of Emily Carr from 1900 to 1945. Because before 1900, color has its own limits. It expands dramatically in the Victorian period and it expands again very dramatically after 1945. So since she's working in that window, it was important to have that. And then the architects were so floored that I seemed so literate in color that they graciously allowed me to place all of the panels so that it has a kind of rhythm. So it's a kind of composition. And then they could also blame it on me. So if you don't like the color panels, the architects can just say, well, that's fine. It was an artist that <laughs> did it. So anyway, I think, I think color is, is a very interesting kind of connector, but it doesn't, it's not everybody's thing, but thanks. Okay. Well, I wasn't aware of that color uh, blindness thing and that's a wonderful uh, purple couch behind you and uh, green painting. <laughs> uh, we have another online question. Okay. Um, and, and that comes from uh, Janet and Jeff and they want to know, What's next for All you, right. Landon? Well, I think I'd set a couple of extra slides in case we had a chance maybe to do that. Um, maybe Justine, you could find those. Um, in, uh, so, so one idea of artists is that they have um, one kind of project, but for me, I have about three or four threads going all the time. And so the particle paintings, the signal paintings, and then these geometric paintings have been really important as well. So here's a shot pretty recently from the studio as if we were there right now. Um, this is a puzzle, it's called cross, Crossword. I have a, my eldest child is very skilled at crossword puzzles and designs them for himself. And uh, I find that I'm always interested in cutting them out of the paper, not doing them. And there's a history of making geometric abstraction uh, like this. I've changed each of the color bars quite, uh, uh, quite a bit. But if you think of Helma of Klimt work, you think of early Kandinsky clay, um, you think of Mondrian, you think of people that went into geometric color, especially when you recognize that any picture of anything is so loaded. Painting is so complex in its own way. And each painting's image um, does carry so much other content. So that's why I do these ge geometric works. And in behind there are two or three other paintings that I work on in succession. And under the floor with the cardboard, so I can work on it all. I think there's another slide that's going to show you what's under there. Maybe we go to that one. 
And this is where I've got big pink sky number five on the go. And you can see also that I have my COVID night blue there. Um, Who's that question? Being finished. And the one on the floor, um, you know, you, you can just see that I'll get back to it when I have room. So it'll go up on its stretcher, which is in behind the purple one soon. I always start everything on the floor or the table. Uh, a little bit of a Jackson Pollock uh, reference, but he's a flinger and I'm a dripper. So there's a critique of Pollock in a way or a homage to Pollock. Um, and then this palimpsest of the color, the whites, the color, the whites, the color, the white. And they're all the same size, those big pink paintings. And then it'll go on its stretcher and I'll switch to oil and continue. So that's what's next. Thank you. Actually, you know, the online questions are pouring in here, Landon. And so I'm going to extend it a little bit because you've done such a wonderful job. Um, Lisa asks, what foreign location has inspired your work most? Oh, I, I, well, Berlin, for sure. Um, I mean, right now, I was supposed to be in a big residency in Mexico City. That got canceled. Um, a year ago, I was in Noha, Spain. Um, and that was amazing but I on my own those were invited ones and my own I, I chose a couple of sort of self-initiated sabbatical times to go and uh, create work in Berlin particularly in 2007 I went there and it wasn't so much the hot spot that it became uh, and it was in the winter I like to go away sort of in the winter where you're kind of bundled under your black coat <laughs> no one can find you um, <laughs> And I, I think that's when I really tripped onto working on paper in a way that was really powerful. And I was also at the same time reading the whole history of Germany uh, in English. I had various friends. Actually, Rene van Helm was an old friend and studio mate, was living in Berlin at the same time. And she had been there a few years and had a great library. And I would go maybe once a week and she'd trade me a new book. <laughs> I'd, I'd go off with my new German history. Um, it, it's a complicated history, obviously. And uh, I found I was just very drawn to, to try to struggle with my own interpretations and went back as a guest in 2013 as a resident of ZKU. And in between, I, I spent half a year in Paris. So these cities as nervous systems uh, have big appeal and spending time in Europe. Yeah. Wonderful answer. And uh, as I said, the this is an exceptional broadcast in, in the fact that so many online questions are pouring in. So we're going we're gonna to end with one last online question, and it comes from Ben. And Ben asks, to what extent does the size of your canvas affect its meaning? Ah, okay. Well, I want to quote, uh, the, one of the founders of the Tawatan Canadian Connection was Jeff Spaulding, who passed away very tragically um, last fall while we were in China. He was not, he was not allowed back in because he'd been a bit bad. So anyway, um, Jeff used to say to me, you know, paintings are way too big everywhere, but yours are fine. He said, a painting should only be as big as it absolutely needs to be. So for Ben, I would say, I need to get lost in the painting. So what a big painting was when I first began might be six by eight feet or seven by eight. Now I need to double the size to sort of get lost and, and find my, my route. Um, I also think that the big paintings are read by the body in a way where if you're lucky enough, lucky to have it in a public place where people can spend some time. And that's why I was so grateful that the big um, pink sky that we've discussed before was at the Odin Art Museum. Uh, now it's in the vault, but it, it's been rotated out from a very prime spot that people can actually experience a painting, mm, you know, for something else. And while at the same time, I do know that small works draw my attention when I'm in collections. I spend a lot of time visiting collections, by the way, you know, all over the world, you know. Um, I think it's important for artists to look at those collections uh, and to look at art, real art. But I hope that um, maybe I'll just end by saying that, you know, the relationship between the mark and the, the scale and the, the idea of the visitor or the viewer is important. And I think, you know, for the painting that you have, perhaps just to end, you know, I was trying to deal with a very, very large subject about grief and loss and premature loss of a child. And 
or of an adult child who who's who has so much ahead of them and you need a big space I, I think you need both time and the inches and the layers I, I think to make it really have some justice okay well thank you so much uh, you've provided such an insightful uh, discussion of your work uh, and I must say every good curator and good artist needs to be a little bit bad. Um, and I want to thank the entire Odane Art Museum team, our founder, Michael Odane and Yoshi Karasawa, our trustees, our members, uh, the TNT crew, our director, producer, Justine Nickel, our quality control coordinator, Erica Chan. And I just want to remind all our viewers on Zoom that the museum is reopening on Friday, June 26th, and will be open through the remainder of the summer, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, and we'll also have a special dining experience that we'll be announcing shortly. Um, in addition, I'd like to give a shout out to Jim, Rosemary, and Gualaga on Haida Gwaii, and a shout out to Joyce Zemans in Toronto. Uh, Joyce was one of my early undergraduate uh, professors at York University, and I know uh, Landon has had a long-standing relationship with her as well. So thanks for staying up so late, Joyce, in Toronto. Um, and uh, next week, we want to announce that it'll be episode seven that'll feature Kim Dorlin, also a former student of Landon's, who will be talking about Last Light. So I want to say good night uh, from TNT, and thank you so much, Landon. You've been dynamite. Good night. Good night, Curtis. Thanks very much. Okay. Take care, everyone, and have a great evening.